I ask that you locate the call to worship at this time. And as you are able, please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord is calling. The Lord has forgiven us. The Lord is healing us. Let us come together to become God's people and and praise this day. Amen. We come to that point in our service where we lift up our joys and concerns to the Lord and to share those joys and concerns with our fellow worshipers. Let us pray. Oh God, you have seen every point in our lives where we have fallen short yet you've forgiven us, asking only in return for us to forgive others. We realize that we surely try your patience with our inconsistencies. We expect you to forgive our worst sins, but are unwilling to forgive the petty sins of our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and our friends. We remind those closest to us just how many times they've offended us, but forget the numberless times you have forgiven us for a wide range of sins. We want justice for our neighbor's misdemeanors, but mercy for our own felonies. We don't have the same tolerance for others as we have for ourselves. Please, dear God, forgive us for such unevenness. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now Nancy will uh, bring us the, the uh, epistle lesson and the gospel reading this morning. Our epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows him to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike, and each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he wasn't able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My message this morning is entitled, There's a Better Way Than Shooting Somebody. A Better Way Than Shooting Somebody. <laughs> you know, there's a story that Alfred Lord Tennyson once invited a Russian nobleman to his estate to do some hunting. The nobleman went off by himself one morning and returned later that day. How did you do, asked Tennyson. Not too well, replied the nobleman. I shot two peasants. You mean two pheasants, Lord Tennyson said with amusement. We pronounce it with a PH, pheasant. No, the nobleman said. I mean two peasants. You see, they were insolent to me, and so I shot them. That story is outrageous, of course. You don't shoot someone because they're insolent to you, or do you? <laughs> Last week I told a couple of Tony Campola stories, and in keeping with that tradition, I will do so again because I really like Tony. Another little story from Tony says uh, a Philadelphia man killed a driver who cut in front of him on the expressway. Now the murderer explained that traffic had slowed as it was being funneled into a single lane. He claimed that he had waited in line for more than a quarter of an hour to enter the flow of traffic. And just as he was about to do so, another car passed him on the shoulder of the highway and cut in front of him. Now as though that were not enough, the driver laughed and made an obscene gesture at him. It was too much for him to handle. You see, when traffic later stopped because of congestion, he removed a gun from his glove compartment, got out of his car, walked up to the side of the car of the man who had, who had cut him off and shot him to death. The injustice of what had happened was bad enough, but being laughed at and taunted was more humiliation than he could even tolerate. Now you don't shoot somebody just because they're insolent with you, do you? Unfortunately, some people do. Our question for the morning is, how do you deal in a Christian way with anger? We all do get angry, don't we? Even Jesus got angry. How do we deal with anger? How do we change anger from a stumbling block to a stepping stone? Now, first of all, we need to acknowledge the destructive ways, destructive, note the emphasis, ways that people use to deal with anger. Some people, when they're angry, just sort of let it all hang out, don't they? They give into it. They blow up in every direction. Shoot the peasants. Kick the dog, throw a brick through a window. The danger is obvious. Often these folks excuse themselves by saying that they have an uncontrollable temper. They lie. There's no such thing as an uncontrollable temper. 
We all maintain some control over our anger or there would be dead bodies scattered everywhere, right? Now there's a good story about Rudolf Bing, who for years and years was the general manager of the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Bing disliked having to negotiate with trade union, unions. He knew that it was time for a whole lot of hysteria. Now one attorney's behavior was particularly outrageous. After one colorful tirade, Bing leaned across the table toward the union's lawyer and said, I'm awfully sorry, I didn't get that. Would you mind screaming it again? By use of ridicule, Bing showed the true nature of the opposing attorney's outburst, childish, infantile. A young mother and her little boy were driving down the street. The little boy asked, Mommy, why do the idiots only come out when Daddy drives? <laughs> Someday that little boy will understand that Daddy's anger says more about Daddy than it does about the quality of drivers on the road. Now, a woman came to see the uh, evangelist, Billy, evangelist Billy Sunday and asked him to pray for her bad temper. Then, embarrassed, she added, but it's over in just a minute. So's a shotgun, answered Sunday, but it blows everything to bits. It simply won't work for us to blow off steam in every direction whenever something annoys us. It's childish. And sometimes it can be very, very destructive. Equally as destructive, however, can be suppressing anger. Anger turned inward produces depression and, and ulcers and high blood pressure and maybe even a susceptibility to cancer. The analogy of a pressure cooker is a valid one. You can't sit on that steam forever without it seeking an outlet. Now, it's sad to say, but blowing off steam is healthier than holding it in, isn't it? As one author notes, John L. Lewis, the labor <laughs> leader who spilled out his anger for Franklin D. Roosevelt in no uncertain terms, lived vigorously to the age of 89. But Roosevelt, who more often smiled than expressed anger, died at 63 of cardiovascular disease. Harry Truman, known for his colorful outbursts, lived to the ripe old age of 88. This is especially true for anyone with high blood pressure, so it's dangerous to express anger, but it's also dangerous to suppress it, to keep it inside. Related to suppression is the idea that we can laugh off our anger. A Leadership Magazine cartoon pictures a pastor sitting with two obviously fuming parishioners around a table in his office. The caption reads like this, with our current hard feelings, would anyone object to my praying with my eyes open? <laughs> Humor can release tension, but it doesn't dispel the underlying anger. Hostility does not miraculously vanish, does it? Now, a final destructive way of dealing with anger is to break off relationships, to break off relationships. There was a picture in the newspaper sometime back of two sisters standing in a house that had a line painted down the center of the room. The sisters, you see, had had a dispute they decided to split the house in two, with one living on one side and the other on the other side. They no longer spoke to one another, nor visited with each other. How tragic, but how common this way of dealing with anger in families and in churches. All the little stories I just shared demonstrate destructive ways to deal with anger. You see, we're all too familiar with them. History's brimming with examples of the harm of unharnessed hostility. Now we need to see, however, that there are also constructive as opposed to destructive ways of dealing with anger. Constructive. 
Anger is a very appropriate response to perceived injustice. Robert Polhill, you may recall, when he was released by his kidnappers in Lebanon back in 1990, said that he maintained his sanity by striving to hold on to his anger at these terrorists who had abducted him. Polhill knew that he needed the emotional and the mental energy from that anger if he was going to remain sharp under such trying conditions. His anger was most appropriate and he used it in a very positive way. It kept him sane during his captivity. Of course, once he was home, he had to let go of that anger or it would have been destructive rather than constructive. Still, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with anger, particularly in the face of injustice. Back in 1934 in Bavaria, there was a little 11-year-old boy, a, a young Jewish boy named Heinz. Now, Heinz learned his religious teachings very, very well. You see, the Hitler youth were roaming the streets in those days. One day, one of the bullies caught young Heinz and he channeled and controlled his frustration and anger, and he talked his way out of the situation rather than turning anger into violence. A little later, Heinz's family moved to the United States and Americanized their name, and you may know this. We know little Heinz today as Henry Kissinger. He learned well how to talk rather than to fight, and that lesson, that lesson served him as well as our country for a long, long time. Now it's okay to be angry with evil. Jesus was angry with evil. If we can channel that anger appropriately, it can be a plus rather than a minus. Anger, if viewed destruct or constructively, can even open possibilities for us we might never have seen otherwise. And I've got a, an example here. George Crum was an Indian chief a century and a half ago. He was also a chef at the Moon Lake Lodge in Saratoga Springs, New York. Now wealthy Cornelius Vanderbilt came in one evening and ordered a rather new dish called French fried potatoes. French fried potatoes. This was something new. When it was brought out, he sent it back to the kitchen saying that they were too thick for French fries. After all, he had just returned from France. So George Crumb prepared more French fries and he cut them even thinner and again, Vanderbilt sent them back. Now George Crumb was frustrated and just a little bit angry. So he cut the next potato razor thin and he dipped it in boiling fat and he personally took them out to Vanderbilt. Surprise! Vanderbilt liked this American variation of French fries. You see, George Crumb had invented what we call today potato chips. His frustration and anger had led to a new food invention. See, anger can be channel channeled positively. Anger is a natural emotion, isn't it? That says to me that anger is a gift from God. There are some things we ought to get angry about, aren't there? There are some positive things that can come from our anger. Nevertheless, sooner or later, we need to get rid of our anger, don't we? So how do we do that? How do we do that? There are only two ways. The first is to seek reconciliation with the person who has caused our anger. You'll remember that in last week's scripture, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if you can't express your anger constructively, if you can't sit on it, if you can't laugh it off, and if you know deep in your heart that breaking off fellowship with this person is not right, then the Christian way of dealing with anger is to go to that person and seek to swear accounts. Can you think of any other way of dealing with anger? Any other way? There isn't any other way. We might prefer to nurture our resentment 
We might rather retaliate, but if we're going to live like Jesus, we're going to have to seek reconciliation. One more story, and then I'll wrap this up. There was a Chinese Christian who owned a rice paddy. Now, his neighbor was a communist. To irrigate his rice paddy, the Christian pumped water manually out of a nearby canal. Each day after the Christian had pumped enough water to fill his field, the communist would come out and remove some of the boards that kept the water in the Christian's field. In this way, he flooded his own field with having to do any work. Now the Christian was beside himself with rage, not knowing where else to turn. He took his complaint to God. The Lord, hearing his prayer, gave him an answer. The next morning, the Christian arose much earlier and started pumping water into the field of his communist neighbor. Then he replaced the boards and pumped water into his own rice paddy. Now in a few weeks, both fields of rice were doing well. And not only that, but his communist neighbor neighbor came to Christ. Now that's how it's done. We seek reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, And sometimes it doesn't. Then we turn the situation over to God. We pray, Lord, I've done all I can. I've tried to make things right. Nothing has worked. Now it's up to you. Whatever happens, please take the ache of anger and resentment out of my heart before it becomes destructive to me and to others. Do you have a better way of dealing with anger? I don't think so. Many, many people have messed up their lives and the lives of others because they chose a destructive way to handle anger and resentment. Anger can be a positive force when it's in response to injustice and when it's channeled in positive ways. Sooner or later, it must be disposed of. How? By going to your brother or sister and seeking reconciliation and by going to God and seeking his help and finding release. Nobody shoots someone else because they're insolent to them, do they? Heaven help us, sometimes it does happen. There's a better way, not the way demonstrated on this morning's bulletin cover though. It's the way of reconciliation and divine love. Amen and amen.
please hear now the benediction. Go freely now in the perfect love of Christ Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit and led by the love of God. Amen. Thank you.